holes dug out for the tires of the uh, car to go on, and then somebody pulled us across with a rope. And um, we got there, and they were having a baptism, and and um, uh, this was a Hindu village, and uh, there was a whole group of people over there waiting to be baptized, and they were weeping and wailing and weeping. And I thought to myself, um, this should be a happy time to be baptized. And then I asked the uh, one person there we were with, I said, why is everybody so sad and, and weeping like this? And he said, because they are taking a stand uh, for Christ in this Hindu village and uh, some of them are going to be ousted from their family from this day on because they're making a public profession for Christ. Others, when they get home, they're going to be beaten. And I remember that day that uh, that phrase, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, took on some new meaning for me. And um, later on in that same trip, we were doing a crusade in uh, after the, at the last night, uh, I was preaching that night, and, and I looked, and there was a whole group of ladies coming up, and they wanted us to pray for them. And again, they were all weeping, these ladies, and they had some kids with them. And I asked the interpreter, I said, what is, uh, what, what is wrong, and what, what, how should I pray? And he said, well, these ladies want you to pray for them because they came here, walked for hours to get here to this crusade, And tonight, they'll walk hours to go back to be beaten by their husbands for coming here, which was legal to be beaten by their husbands. And uh, I just thought, you know, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Uh, When I saw those kinds of things, it just really sunk in what that means (laughs) to people uh, that have to live in those kind of circumstances. And I know that some of you have been in places like that. Uh, I know that. And, uh, but anyway, uh, it's been our privilege to be here with you this, these couple days, and thank you for the invitation, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, uh, share with you, and thank you for listening. <laughs> and hopefully <clears throat> something that uh, has been said would, would help you in your life and ministry. Uh, Let's, one one more time, let's go to Philippians 2. Now, you know, Philippians is, I love the book of Philippians. Um, And so when they said your theme is from the book of Philippians, I I really got excited because I like this book. And um, uh, so we won't get through it. We're going to get through chapter 2. Uh, but chapter 3 and 4, you can read on your own, but there's also uh, some amazing truths in chapter 3 and 4 that, that uh, really will help us, uh, will help you in your life. Uh, but we're talking about the mindset of Christ. Uh, one translation calls it an attitude. What we need to understand is that attitudes open doors or close doors for us. And um, so we all have to watch our attitude, that we have the attitude or the mindset of Christ because it's it, our attitude paves a path before us to fulfill the calling of God for our lives, or an attitude can close the door. And uh, so it's really important um, that we pay attention to this. I want to read again uh, Philippians 2, uh, a, a pretty large portion of it. I'm, I'm going to read it from the NLT, and then we'll... Uh, read verse 5 in the NIV. It says, Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges, 
He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you, and now that I'm away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Do everything. Everybody say everything. everything. Do everything without complaining and arguing. <laughs> everything. So that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Like that little girl talked to us this morning. That we need to shine as lights in the world. Hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day of Christ's return, I'll be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. But I will rejoice even if I lose my life. Pouring it out like a liquid offering to God. Just like your faithful service is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share that joy. Yes, you should rejoice, and I will share your joy. Do you realize that your faithful service is an offering to God? It's amazing. So we looked at this. Uh, well, let's, do, let's do verse 5 in the NIV. Verse 5 in the NIV. There we go. In your relationships... This is where we kind of left off yesterday. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. In our relationships with one another. And we're, we're, we're talking here in the context of a family of people like Tyler, YWAM Tyler, working together to fulfill the vision and the purpose that God has placed here in this in this ministry. So in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So here's something that Paul was very concerned about. Uh, he, he, he was, uh, evidently there was some things that, that, were, that were like looming and maybe he knew some things where people were... Um, that, that, that this disunity threatened this church. And this is a danger that threatens every healthy ministry, church or ministry. So to maintain unity and overcome disunity lies in our attitude or our mindset. He said, you make me happy when you agree. And one of the, the things about this attitude and this mindset is to take an interest in other people and in other ministries. And I know that in YWAM, Tyler, you have a multitude of ministries. And so it's not all about your own ministry or the ministry you're working in. It's about taking an interest in other ministries uh, that are working beside you. See, sometimes what can happen in a ministry with multifaceted or multi areas of ministry, you can build silos without even hardly thinking. And, and so it's kind of like all these silos and everybody's is doing their own little thing in their own little silo. But uh, tear the silos down. And the way you do that is by taking an interest in someone else's ministry. And when you take an interest in, in the whole, then the silos begin to come down. And it just makes for a better unified way. You, you can accomplish much more 
if you eliminate the silos in a ministry. Then he goes on to say here that with the attitude of Jesus, we shine brightly for him. And I think that's where we ended up uh, yesterday. Um, and I could say some more things about that, but I want to finish this chapter. In uh, verse 19, same chapter. If the Lord Jesus is willing, I hope to send Timothy to you soon for a visit. This is the Apostle Paul, now remember, speaking, writing this letter from prison. He says, then he can cheer me up by telling me how you are getting along. There's the, there it is again. It's concerned that these people were getting along with one another. Then he can cheer me up by telling me how you're getting along. I have no one else like Timothy who genuinely cares about your welfare. All the others care only for themselves and not for what matters to Jesus Christ. But you know how Timothy has proven himself like a son with his father. He has served with me in preaching the good news. I hope to send him to you just as soon as I find out what is going to happen to me here. And I have confidence from the Lord that I myself will come to see you soon. What I get from this little, uh, from unpacking this little uh, part here, everyone needs a close friend and confidant. Confidant. Someone that cares about you and your life. Someone that will ask you questions about yourself. You know, you can't grow in isolation. Connected people grow. People that have relationships grow. It's hard to grow in isolation. Maybe I shouldn't say you can't, but it is difficult to grow in isolation. Someone you can trust totally and always has your best in mind. You see, you can have hundreds of people working at YWAM Tyler, and in, in all of that community, there can still be people in your community, and there probably are, that are lonely. And they do not have solid connections with people. And so, faith grows in Faith works in community. Faith, it's hard for faith to work in secret. Cheryl and I were ministering to a, a, well, I got this call from somebody in the church. Sometimes people still call me, even though I'm not the lead pastor anymore, because I had a, you know, a connection with them for many, many years. And, and I talked to Matt, the lead pastor. I said, is that okay? He said, you, you go right ahead. There's no problem. And so this uh, individual called me and and his daughter had um, wanted to marry this man that had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. And um, so the father just felt like she shouldn't get married to him because maybe he would die, like soon. And I asked, the first question I asked him, I said, uh, and, and you know, sometimes in times like this, when people come to you and ask you questions, you really have to rely on the Holy Spirit right at the moment. You know, you can't go home and say, okay, I'll intercede for that for a couple of days and I'll get back to you. No, you gotta have the, you got to have the life of God in you and the power of God in you right then to give an answer. Then I said, how old is she? He said, 25. I said, look, come on, Marlon. She's 25 years old. She can make her own decision. Why would you want to stand in the way of your daughter? And why would you want to create more hurt by not walking her down the aisle? I said, if she's going to get married and, and she knows that the marriage might be short or he might even get healed, who knows? And so he did. He walked her down the aisle, which was a great thing. And um, so now I get another call and her husband, you know, he, he, he's getting worse. It's only like 26. And so he said, would you come to their house, this young couple now, and would you pray over them? And so I said, okay. But the husband, the, the, the man that has a terminal illness, does not want to his parents to be there. 
and both parents come to our church. But he doesn't want his parents to be there. And I said, why? He said, because he feels that they don't have enough faith. You know, it's never a matter of having enough faith. It's, that's never the problem. The problem is using the faith you have. <laughs> we, 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 have a, we have faith. Jesus gave us faith when we were born again. So it's not a matter of having enough faith. It's a matter of using what we have. <laughs> Everybody smile at me. <laughs> you look a little scary. So I thought, you know what, I'm not, I'm talking about here, you know, having unity, I'm talking about uh, people caring for you, I'm talking about uh, faith grows and works in community, that's what I'm talking about, okay? So, so um, I said to the, the girl's dad, I said, well, I'm not, I'm not going to come to their house and pray for them if he doesn't want his parents. I said, I'm just, I don't want to get into that mess. And so, I mean, like an hour later, the father of the groom, call, or of, the, of the man calls me. And we talk. And then I said, look, Gary, you go and have a conversation with your son. And I, if you, if both parents are there, I'll gladly come and pray. So last Sunday... On the way home from a place where we were preaching, we stopped at their house and prayed for them, and both parents were there. Now, I don't know if he'll get healed or not. I just did, I got a report yesterday that he's not doing very well. But the thing about it is, you, you, I did not want, if he does die, what kind of, what kind of that's a, make the hurt even bigger if he doesn't have a relationship with his parents? Sometimes people die in, 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 the, in, the, in the whole realm of faith and, and they, don't, they don't want to talk about the possibility of dying and so they don't want to talk about it, don't want to talk about it and they don't even have any talks with their family before they go unconscious and then it's a big, 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 big hurt. I had a pastor who had pancreatic cancer uh, that I was overseeing up in New York, Albany, New York. And that happened to him because he went, you know, he's, he's in faith and I'm believing God. And, and, you know, sometimes when people do that, you can't even talk to them. You can't get to the heart. That's just, that's really, I, I question whether that's faith. I think it's more fear than anything. That's what I think because faith works in community. And he died, never said goodbye to his wife, never said goodbye to his kids. Tragic. So now his kids are upset, mad at God, when God had nothing to do with that. God's not the author of sickness. I don't know why some people don't receive it. This young man, I hope he receives it. I don't know if he will or not. But everyone needs a close friend and confident that you can talk to. So... so this leads us a little bit into this area of accountability and relationship within um, your, your lives here in this space. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Dear brothers and sisters, if, any, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. If you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. In 1 Thessalonians 5.11, it says, So encourage each other and build each other up, just as you are already doing. A lady called me, this was a couple years ago, crying on the phone. My husband is having an affair. And and, uh, I said, is he there? (laughs) I get... I get really bold in these kind of situations because it just ticks me off how the devil tries to ruin people's lives and ruin ministries and churches. This is a pastor of a church of 400 people in, in, in Danbury, Connecticut. And she's on the phone. I said, is he there? She said, yeah. I said, put him on the phone. I said, Barry, 
Is it, what are you doing? He said, well, you know, I said, Barry, get, pack a suitcase and come down to see me. He said, you mean today? I said, yeah. So they did. Same day. Sat with him and, man, she was, she lit into him because he was making excuses, you know, for having this affair. I wanted to beat him up too. (laughs) Just acknowledge it. You were caught. You were caught. So, um, so we, we talked and prayed and, you know, we got him counseling and, and all this kind of stuff. And she's the hero because she stayed with him. And, uh, so we thought we had him, you know, restored and he goes back to the lady again. Oh, and he did it again the third time. And by that time, my overseer, I'm, I'm, I'm a regional director in, the, in that area, and my overseer, he got on the phone, he said, Sam, Sam, I'm done. I'm done with him, Sam, I'm done, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm taking his credentials and he can do what he wants. I said, Doug, can I keep working with him? You can do what you want, Sam. I'm done. Well, you know, I hate to give up on people. I just hate to give up on people. I know Jesus doesn't give up on us. He doesn't say three strikes and out. Aren't you glad he doesn't? I went to Barry. I said, Barry, I'm going to keep working with you if you want, if you want help. He said, I want help. I want help, Sam. I said, keep crying. <laughs> See, I'm, 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 I'm just honest with people like that. I'm just, I'm not beating around the bush like he was. So anyway, make a long story short, we, Sherlin and I stayed in there with that couple. Well, this is now some years later. Their marriage is strong. Their church, they just built a new church building. We were just there dedicating it a couple of weeks ago. And I'm, when I'm dedicating that church, I'm thinking, wow, this could have turned out totally different. Thank God for the redeeming power of Christ. Yeah. And that's why we need to hang in with one another. That's why we need... See, if he would have had a close see, see, I, I didn't stray too far from my point. If he would have had a close confidant, maybe he, that wouldn't have happened. I know people, I, I know that even if you have a close confidant, if you really want to go sin, you can do it. But I'm so glad. And he had three grown sons when this happened. I had to meet with each son. And tell them what their father did. Wow. It's not always fun being an overseer. But the sons were all at this dedication. Restored with their dad. So Jesus can do it. How about it? Aren't you glad for his redeeming power? So. Everybody needs to have a close friend and confidant. Cheryl and I, have, we've just been blessed to have that all, um, all these years. People that we can go to. I'll never forget when at the funeral for our little boy, um, we were part of a, a, a Bible study group. And at the funeral of our little boy, the, at the viewing, uh, a guy comes through and his wife. And, and we knew them a little bit. And when we looked at each other, him and this, me and this man, we just like fell into each other's arms and wept. And that day, um, it, it was like, it was like we were knit together as brothers in Christ. And he has been my closest friend for, for all these years since 1974. And so whenever I want to talk about something, that's where I go. And um, 
So I want to encourage you, you know, leaders, uh, friendships like this bring security and protection into our lives. Leaders work with teams of people every day to fulfill the vision God has given them. This carries a responsibility that only leaders understand. Nobody understands totally what it is to pastor a church and to carry the responsibility of pastoring a church except the pastor. Even though we take days off, we're never really off in ministry. Therefore, close friendships with other leaders brings a depth of care and understanding that is necessary for every leader to stay healthy and strong emotionally, physically, and mentally. So I want to encourage you on this point to evaluate your life in this area. If you're lacking in this, ask God to connect you with someone. Are you with me? (laughs) Everyone needs a close friend and confidant. Then the last portion of of this uh, chapter is in verse 25. It says, meanwhile, the Apostle Paul says, meanwhile, I thought I should send Epaphroditus back to you. He's a true brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier. And he was your messenger to help me in my need. I was sending him because he's been longing to see you, and he was very distressed that you heard he was ill. So this guy was sent there with Paul to take care of Paul's needs, but he became ill. And he certainly was ill. In fact, he almost died. But God had mercy on him and and also on me so that I would not have one sorrow after another. So I'm, I'm all the more anxious to send him back to you, for I know you'll be glad to see him, and then I will not be so worried about you. Welcome him in the Lord's love and with great joy and give him the honor that people like him deserve for he risked his life for the work of Christ and he was at the point of death while doing for me what you couldn't do from far away. Now this little part right here, the way I unpack this is always honor and esteem one another. This man risked his life for Paul. And when the church heard that Paul was in prison, they sent Epaphroditus with a gift. And by associating himself with Paul, he took the risk of becoming involved in the same charge. And he got sick and almost died, so Paul sent him back with this letter to this church. But he was concerned because some people would probably call him a quitter because they had sent him back to stay with Paul. So we should always help people to not be embarrassed and help them save face. We should always give appropriate honor to people who we have learned from and who have served us in some way through the years. I remember when we uh, started our Bible study way back when we got seven of us got filled with the Holy Spirit and we started a Bible study in one of those seven's house and that Bible study grew to a hundred people in someone's house on Tuesday nights. <laughs> and uh, but we were young, we 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 didn't know much about doctrine. I mean, we got into all kinds of stuff. We thought everybody had a demon, and we were trying to cast people demons out of everybody. And re- re- later on, realized it was just the flesh that we were trying to cast out. I mean, it was a mess. <laughs> and everybody had to take a turn to have those demons cast out. And if you said you didn't have any, you had them for sure. <laughs> because you were rebellious. I remember one night, it was my turn to do the casting out. <laughs> I mean, we did this sometimes till 2 and 3 in the morning. And so it was one of the elders turned to have be cast out. I mean, have to have the demons cast out of him. And, and I was the caster outer. So, so I was like on top of him. Come out 
by him in Jesus' name. Come out of him. This is the same guy. You know, this is like, I mean, and he's going, ah, ah, poop, poop, ah. He's going like that, and I'm like, come out of him. You know, after a while, I thought, this is stupid. This is ridiculous. And I jumped off of him, and I went out to the kitchen. We were in a house, you know, went out to the kitchen. And they all said, oh, the demons went into Sam. <laughs> there are some real demons. But <laughs> we were trying to cast out something else there. I don't know what. I remember one time after um, this guy said, would you come and pray for my wife? part of our church and I said sure I said are you going to be there he said yeah so I went and knocked on the door and and he came to the door and he said come on in and as soon as I stepped inside I said don't come near me he said come on in (laughs) don't come near me he said come on over come on over so I went over where this voice was coming from, and it was his wife. And, I'm, and all of a sudden, I got bold. You know, and I, I just felt this thing come out of me, and I said, in the name, and I walked toward her, and I said, in the name of Jesus, come out of you. In the name of Jesus, come out of her. Come out of her. And I was doing like that, and all of a sudden, she gets up, and she starts running around the house, taking off her clothes, she got a hold of a vase and threw it, and it, 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 it must have shattered into hundreds of pieces. And her husband said, what am I supposed to do? I said, the next time she comes around, tackle her. <laughs> so, so she's coming around, and by this time, she only had her panties and bra on. And I'm sure glad that he was there. And he, I said, tackle her. So he tackled her, and she's on the, gr- she's on the floor, and I, he's, he's on top of her, and I'm on top of him. Come out of her in the name of Jesus! I must have done that for 10 minutes, and all of a sudden she, she goes like this. She said, Claire, who's this guy? <laughs> and uh, Claire said, well, you know, I asked Pastor Sam to come pray for you. And uh, so he got a blanket and wrapped her up and everything, and... Next, next Sunday she came to church and uh, she came for a while but we found out she was in witchcraft and she went back. And when she went back she got worse and ended up in a mental institution. I'll tell you another story that it ended, out be- ended up better. So we had a, a TV program, and at the end of the program, uh, we had a number that people could call, and somebody called in and asked the person who answered the phone. He said, would you and Pastor Sam come pray for my wife? And I said, he said, would you come pray? On your, I said, sure, it's on the way home. So we went there, and we opened the door, and, and the guy comes to the door, and uh, I look over on the bay window, and uh, his wife is over there, up on the bay window with her hands in the air uh, making sounds like a monkey. Like, (laughs) and uh, I looked at the guy and the guy that was with me, man, he was hiding behind me. (laughs) And so he said, come on in, come on in. And again, I got bold and I went over and I said, in the name of Jesus, come out of her. And I went over and when I was about Three or four feet away from her, she, she goes like this, and she jumps down, and she said to her husband, uh, who are these two guys here? And um, so we prayed, and we left, and then some years later, actually only about four or five years ago, on a, a, a Sunday after church, this lady comes up to me, she said, do you remember me? And I said, no, I don't remember you. She said, remember the lady that you came to pray for that night that was acting strange and weird? I said, yeah. She said, I'm her. And I've been okay ever since. So, you know, sometimes there are real demons. So we were all messed up in our theology and our doctrine. And so we looked for somebody to come teach us. And a a couple by the name of Luke and Edna Weaver 
They're now, she's in heaven, he's still living, he's now 94 years old. Came and taught us, set us straight, and put us on, on a balanced uh, doctrinal path, you know. And it was, it, it just, it's just, there, there's times you just have to honor people that helped you. So we honor them to this day. When our, when our little boy died, they, knocked, they lived 40 miles away from us, so they had to drive almost an hour. That night, knocked on our door and stayed in our house and slept in our house that night. So you need to esteem and honor one another. So this is, this is chapter 1 and chapter 2. <laughs> So much, so much here that applies to all of us as we're meeting here. I know my time's almost up, uh, but I want to leave you with something. Um, in Matthew 4, I want to leave you with this. In Matthew 4, it says, One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water. For they fished for a living. And Jesus called out to, out to them, Come follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. I will show you how to fish for people. When you fish for a fish, you catch something that is alive and it dies. But when you fish for people, you catch something that is dead and it lives. He said, come follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. Well, he spent the next three years showing them. And he went and he prayed for one. He preached to multitudes. He did... Many, 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 many things. He showed them how to fish for people. And that's what you all do. That's what you all do. Never has anyone treasured people like Jesus. He taught his disciples this as he traveled with, as they traveled with him. He demonstrated this by stopping to minister to one person or by preaching to multitudes. He drilled into them day after day that it's all about people. He drilled it into them every day that it's all about loving people, healing people, restoring people, serving and empowering people. I know I don't have to tell you this because that's what you do, but I'm going to tell you anyhow. Because what happens sometimes, the mechanics of ministry steal our heart from people. Even the day he was hanging on the cross, he's thinking about everybody else. He, was, he, 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 he asked God to forgive the soldiers that were, that were gambling for his robe. He was concerned about the thieves on either side of him. He's concerned about his mom. He said, to, he said to, his, to John, he said, take care of my mother. Make sure she's there, cared for. He didn't think about himself. He was thinking about everybody else. He treasured what matters most and stayed focused on it. He understood eternal realities and that only people make it to the other side, heaven or hell. That are the two choices. It says in Matthew 6, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. I know we use this scripture for offerings many times, but really the treasure that he's talking about here is people. Is referring to us investing our lives into people. That is the most important treasure we can have. I have had to remind myself 
sometimes through the years that pastoring is all about people. I can get caught up during my pastoring, I could get caught up in the mechanics of pastoring a church and forget about giving hope and healing and help to people. Or have concern about what was the offering today? How many people were there today? Nothing wrong with that, but it cannot be your priority. Leaders must maintain soft hearts toward hurting people. Jesus was able to love the person unconditionally even though their lifestyle was not good. He looked past the mess a person was in and was able to see what they could become. He was able to look beyond the surface. And that's what we do every day. When we face someone and we preach the gospel to them, we look beyond the surface. We look at the treasure. We don't just look at the field. We look at the treasure in the field. Are you looking at the field or are you looking at the treasure? Recently, Cheryl and I were with a family that had experienced a tragedy. Their son uh, killed in a tragic accident. We were leaving their home and both of us, thanking God for the privilege of speaking life into a family that was hurting deeply. When we as leaders rub shoulders with those who experience the deepest heartache and disappointments, we ourselves stay soft-hearted and always ready to be carriers of hope and healing. When we isolate ourselves in our offices from the hurting and think we're too important to spend time with those who are broken, we harden our hearts toward those that need us the most. So what are you doing to keep your heart tender-hearted toward the hurting? Are you intentionally preparing people, preparing to take people with you to heaven? It's harvest time in the kingdom. Working on a farm, harvest time was exciting, but it was hard work. We never, know how, never knew how much, we always had to get our harvest in. We had a, a, a couple weeks to get it in. We, if we didn't get it in, we lost it. Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. He said, don't say there's still four months and then comes the harvest. He said, look at the fields are already ripe for harvest. So we don't have to pray for the harvest, we have to pray for laborers to be sent into the harvest. Sometimes people say, I hope the Lord comes back tomorrow. I say, I don't. I don't. I have a grandson that's not ready. Why would I want him to come back tomorrow? I'm ready if he does. But I don't want, I'll probably say that as long as I live. People say, I, well, I wish Jesus, uh, no, 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 no. No, there's too many people that are not ready for him to return. I'm ready if he comes, but I have family. And acquaintances. So we, Jesus said, he, after he came back from the wilderness, he stood up in the, in the, in the, in the temple and he said, uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captives free, to give sight to the blind, and to put at liberty those that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Well, now he's in heaven, but we're his body on the earth. We're his hands, we're his feet, we're his mouth here on the earth. So now we say that. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us because he has anointed us to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captives free, to give sight to the blind, to put at liberty those that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That's who we are now. 
I want to speak this scripture over all of us. Would you bow your heads? Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Lord, I pray for every person in this room. Lord, every one of us has a, you, you have a plan and a purpose for us. Some of us know what that is. Others in this room may not, may be struggling to know. Lord, you have anointed us to fulfill the plan and purpose you have for our lives. I pray for each one individually that they would find their lane to swim in. And then I pray for this whole group as a family, as, 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 a, as a corporate group of people. I pray that they would keep their eyes on the fence post for this ministry. I pray for Leland and Fran and the, the, the leadership council and, and the board and other leaders in this, in this uh, ministry. I pray that you would continue to give them wisdom in knowing how to lead uh, this ministry into even greater things than they have ever experienced before. Thank you, Father. We'll give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor in Jesus' name. Thank you very much. Amen. Amen. Uh, you guys, let's 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 take a moment and pray. I I'm always uh, blessed of how God speaks to us, uh, but this is a uh, a life lived that's been speaking to us, and we honor Him. We honor Sherlyn. We honor their obedience to the Lord, and uh, I think it's appropriate for us to declare blessing over them. Can we do that? And uh, you know I. I, I, I'm probably confident the Lord's not going to ask him to jump on anybody, so he probably doesn't need youthful you know, physique anymore. Because you know, but uh, I do believe he has a lot more to declare and to call out and to minister into people's lives. And uh, can you extend your hands uh, to Pastor Sam? And if you're near Sherlyn, then you know, uh, put your hand on her. And and I'm going to ask that we all together at, at one time, let's just declare blessing over them. Begin to just pray for them. Let's return blessing to them, and then I'll close in just a moment. Thank you, Father. We are so grateful, Lord, for the obedience of this couple. Father, we acknowledge that they have been vulnerable with us. They have invested in us. They have given of themselves to us. They have displayed through their actions and their love the very uh, message that they've been preaching. Lord, we pray that you would bless them. We pray that the burdens that they carry for their family, for their children, for their children's children, that you would <laughs> carry those burdens on their behalf. We pray, God, that the things that they still dream with you would come to pass. We pray, Lord, that the, the things that they're not even aware of and yet you are preparing to write on their lives, Lord, that you would give them the gift of faith to walk in it when they hear it and they see it. May they continue to always respond in obedience when your spirit comes upon them, like Pastor Sam has described to us. May they always walk in joy May you give them abundance of your own life and your spirit and your energy. May they have many, many more mountains to climb with you. 
And Lord, use them mightily. We give them our blessing. We return to them honor. We thank you, God, for what you've done through them this weekend. And we receive it. We receive